Be please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship together today. We praise you for all you've created, for all you have given us, and for all you've planned for our lives. Please help us hear and understand. Please help us focus and not leave unchanged. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Buies Creek First Baptist Church. We're glad you've chosen to worship with us today, whether it's here in person or online. If you're a visitor, if you would fill out a little visitor card, we would appreciate it. You can drop it in the offering plate. Um, then, um, or hand it to an usher, I'm sorry. So, what happens next Sunday at 2 a.m.? Time changes. Time changes. So, when, before you go to bed on Saturday night, what do you need to do? Which way? Okay, don't want you to miss anything next Sunday. We're missing several of our Campbell students today who are regular attenders. We hope they're enjoying spring break. Today's service will have a mission focus, and I hope you will be inspired to support missions by praying for mission opportunities donating to support missionaries, or even taking part in missions yourself. Pray, give, go. Perhaps someone who's here this morning will even hear God's calling. We're excited to have Alicia Jones bring our mission message today. She's a native of Raleigh and a member of Fairview Baptist Church since she was five years old. After sensing God's call to missions at age 13, she saw her high school and later Campbell University as her first mission fields. She received a BA in birth through kindergarten education and a master's degree at Southeastern Seminary. During a short-term mission trip to the heart of Europe, she sensed God calling her back to that area. Alicia has worked with Hungarian-speaking people in Hungary, Romania, and Ukraine since 2012. Oh, and she's also Archie and Caroline's granddaughter. <laughs> Alicia, that might be your biggest claim to fame right here. We look forward to hearing you right after the choir sings. Laura? Good morning. morning. <laughs> I would like to invite you all to participate in the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Since 1895, what is now called the Annie Armstrong Easter offering has fueled Southern Baptist mission work in the U.S. and Canada. 100% of the Annie Armstrong Easter offering gives support thousands of missionaries. The North American Mission Board serves a diverse and complex region comprised of United States, Canada, and territories in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. This population is 371 million people. The languages are 350 different, and they are estimated 281 million lost individuals. The unreached people groups are 159. Your gift to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering supports nearly 3,000 missionaries and their families enables hundreds of churches to be planted and thousands of disciples to be made. Your prayer guides are on the side of your pews, and they look like this if you would like a prayer guide, and your offering envelopes are in the pockets, and we will be collecting this offering through the month of March and through Easter. Thank you. Shout for the joy to the Lord, all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs, give thanks to him and praise his name. Let's stand together and begin our worship by singing, We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise.
please read responsively with me. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength. Worship the Lord in holy array. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Hey, Miss Gisela, how are you? Good to see you. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, it's always good to see you. It's good to see Carolyn and Archer, her family, everybody here today. It's just it's a blessing to be able to come, come to our house of worship, or the Lord's house of worship, I should say. We're just so blessed. We don't realize how blessed we really are. And I praise God for that opportunity every, every single day. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for bringing each of us safely to your house this day. We gladly surrender our lives to you in worship and praise. As we gather this day, we remember those who are no longer with us, Lord. For those who are sick, we ask for healing. For those away from us, we ask for your blessing to be on them. We invite your Holy Spirit to move freely among us. Come dwell in our hearts, equip us, Lord, Challenge us, comfort us, and, and teach us. We need you in our lives every day, O oh Lord. Hold us close, Father, each and every day. Inspire us as we learn more about your majestic ways and develop a deeper relationship with you. Father, as we meet now, may we behold your beauty and encounter your grace. May all of us, no matter the circumstances, look to you for comfort and godly wisdom. Thank you, Lord, for the peace and assurance that surpasses all understanding as we maneuver this broken world. We ask all this in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, let's stand again and sing freely, freely.
Join me in prayer, please. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. We just thank you for all your many blessings. We uh, are mindful that we have nothing that hasn't come from you. We ask, Father, now that we come at a time in the service, we have an opportunity to give back a portion of what you've so freely bestowed upon us. We just ask that we do it with a cheerful heart, Father. May you take these tithes and offerings and use them to glorify your name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm so delighted to be here, and uh, it's just a joy to see familiar faces and people that I've met through the years, and um, I just pray God's blessing on all of you this morning and in our time together and in your lives where God has you and on this church. Um, so thank you for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is Alicia Jones, and um, I don't really need to introduce myself anymore, but I do want to say that um, I'm learning day by day that God is always faithful and that man's desire is often to be faithful back to God, but we can only do that in his strength. And um, I did give my life to Christ as a five-year-old, and um, I committed my life to full-time ministry at age 13, not really knowing what that meant, but knowing that there were people all over this world that didn't know about Jesus, and that that was God's answer to my question, and who is telling those people about Jesus? And um, it is a delight to, to say I've received a heritage from the Lord, and um, it's a joy to walk in that, and my prayer is that I might be faithful um, with what I've received. So I bring you this morning just a, a brief um, thought, a brief um, message from God's Word, and next to it a report on what I've been seeing God do in recent times where I live and serve. And uh, I've titled it, Will You Stand and Pray With Me? Because those are the two words that God um, just put in my mind as I was reading Ephesians chapter 6. And he brought those two terms out that often we just want to know, what am I supposed to be doing anyways? And it's so clear in God's word, and he always tells us if we ask him. Um, but these were the two that he encouraged me with in the current season of me coming back to the States for a brief uh, three months, but a blessed one so far, um, to be refueled and to, to get to be with family. And standing and praying are both very active tasks and very intense work in the whole scheme of things. Um, and I want to share a little bit about the thoughts that God brought to me through this word. So I read to you from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10, um, and I'm going to actually finish with the very first two words of, of verse 14. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Therefore, stand. And it goes on to a very familiar part of Scripture with all of the pieces of the armor of God, which I hope you all know very well, because I'm not going to touch on those at all this morning. But you can certainly read and, and study up this week if you have the time, because in order to stand, we need to put on those things. We need to take up those items of the armor of God. And, and I think that many are very familiar with that in this place. But as I came to this scripture, it, it, it just captured my attention, verse 10, that it says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That we're called to something, we're, we're called to be strong, but it really has very little to do with how we're feeling, how, we're, uh, how capable we are of anything. Because it's talking about something that's really beyond us. It's talking about the Lord, and it's talking about his mighty strength and power. And as I, I think about those words and know that those words are, are something um, deeper and stronger than I can even imagine, uh, I, I look back to the Greek and found that that power, it's talking about a dominion about a kingdom, and we all know that God's got his kingdom under his charge and fully in control this day. We know it even if we don't see it and we don't feel it. And that's just a reality that God himself is moving, as I heard even this morning in Sunday school. He is on the move, and it's his work, it's his mission that sent out Jesus, and it's Jesus that sent us out. So that mission belongs to him and he is the one in his mighty power that sustains it. And this 
verse is actually simply an invitation for us to stand up into that, to be strong in it, to join it. And that's a delight to hear, hey, even if I don't have a lot of strength this morning, even if I'm not feeling on my best uh, terms today, he is in charge and he has his power and dominion and it's moving forward. And he simply says to me, be strong, stand in it, take part in it. You all, I'm sure you know the scriptures in, in Second Chronicles where, where the, the king of Israel is conversing with the Lord and, uh, through the prophet, and, and it's, for the battle is not yours but God's. I mean, if we're getting ready for the spiritual battle, there's nothing that we need to really be too concerned about because he's in charge. But the next verse goes on to list all of the things in this world and around us that we can't even see that are fighting back to his dominion and his power. And uh, it does say in Deuteronomy, when uh, Moses is speaking to the people, I mean Joshua, excuse me, he will fight for you. So he's already doing the fighting. But here we are invited at the end of the book of Ephesians through Paul's words to join God in that fight. But we know that that power and that strength, it's not going to come from us. It's going to come from the one, the author of the mission itself. And, And that's such a comfort to me. That's such a comfort to me on a daily basis because it's, it's daunting to look around to see the physical and spiritual battles in our lives. And, and to think about the world, I put a bunch of maps in front of you already through the slides this morning. And, and to think about how big this world is. And, and we as humans, we just can't be concerned about it all. It's just too much. I mean, it's, it's overwhelming to check the news outlets and know what's going on. But even that, God has in control. And what is our, our option to join him in that? Well, well, our option is just to be strong and to stand up and to take on the armor of God and start praying. And that's what I'm bringing before you this morning. Because those, those powers that are, are ruling is what's affecting this whole world and brought brokenness into every little corner and home of it. And I, I show you a map here of, of the Hungarian-speaking world, so to say. Those green patches are people that speak the same language that God has blessed me to be able to learn in serving over there. And I'm, I'm going to take you on a, on a little tour of those stars later. But what I want you to know is that all of those places have people just like you and me that believe in Jesus Christ. And they need the same thing that we're talking about today. They need to be able to stand firm because the spiritual darkness is overwhelming, just like it is right here in Bowie's Creek. And, and God is about a good work there. But as we are called to stand firm and to put on these, um, these uh, pieces of armor, uh, there's an interesting way that we're invited into this. The, the stand firm is, is mentioned in verse 11, first telling us to put on the armor of God so that we'll be able to stand. Because we're not on our own. We need the things that God has given us. His word. We need knowledge of him. We need uh, his strength. We need to know what salvation is and what that means. And, and once we've, we've put those things on, we've dressed in the, the armor of God, then we keep have, having to stand. This concept of stand just, just really caught my attention because you know what? It's a position that's not a resting position, but it's not a busy position position, if you know what I mean. Because either most of us in life, I don't know if there's anyone like me at least in this room, I'm doing one of two things. I'm either on the run or I'm sleeping. Because that's about what life takes these days to keep up with the pace that's going on. You're either doing a million things at one time or you're just asleep or you're doing nothing as we say, you know, scrolling with your finger, whatever that nothing is. But God has called us to an action that is somewhere in between those two. Because, yes, sitting, lying, those are restful. Walking, going, driving, those are busy. But he's called us to stand and to stand firm. And and that term literally um, means to be able to establish something. And that takes time, if you know what I mean. I don't know if you've ever established anything, maybe a garden or, or a family, but none of those types of things that you establish happen real fast. And there's not many of us that will stand for long. If you're talking to somebody, you're like, man, I'm wishing we could sit down already. 
At least I am. I'm, I'm pretty weak, though. And, and I think that God has called us to stand firm in prayer. What would it look like if we spent time every day physically standing and talking to the creator of the world? Our minds would be engaged because we're not really relaxed. We can't fall asleep too easy. How engaged, how actively are we joining God on his mission? He's, he's offered the invitation. And it says in the verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore. Three times we hear the word stand. One of it is withstand. But there's something we need to know about the enemy we're standing against. Because um, even this weekend I was visiting my aunt and she has two dogs. And I mean, she's, she's good at standing. But when that, I don't know how many pound dog comes running at her, she got knocked down into the mud the other day. She told me about it. And that's right. To withstand things takes a lot of effort in this world. Because, because the enemy is strong. So we got to know what our enemy is so that we can withstand. She says, now if I know they're coming for me, I kind of take a stronger stand. So maybe sometimes there's times where we need to take a stronger stand. We need to spend more time in prayer. But the other thing I noticed in these verses, and having done all to stand. And another translation, and after you have done everything to stand. I don't know how many of you are sitting here today, and you just feel like, I've done everything. I've done everything I can. And it's just not, it's not changing. I just, I just wish I knew what I could do more. Well, here it is. This is what you can do more. You can stand. And you can stand firm. And there's also a sense like me where I feel like I've done everything and, and sometimes I feel like there's just something more missing. I put it all out there and, and I can keep on standing. And that's what I think my friends need. I think that's what my friends need in Hungary and Romania and Ukraine because it's hard. Poverty's encroaching. War is encroaching. The, the, the power and control, sin of power and control is encroaching. And I know that what they need, too, is just to be able to stand firm and not give up. Not give up. And so I move on to the, the passage about praying. But before I get there, it says at the start of 14, it says, stand therefore. It's just a call to stand. And then continuing in verses 18 through 20, I read, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayers and supplication, to that end keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me, and opening my mouth boldly, to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak." So once you've, you've set your, your mind on standing, you're, I'm going to join God in his mission, I'm going to stand firm, then, then the next thing is to pray always. That always word has really just gotten me in the past few weeks. I, I mean, I'm just like, God, I, I know I can't do that, but would you help me? Because we need it. And it says with alertness and continually and not giving up in that. And that prayer can be for ourselves, for our neighbors, for the people halfway around the world that God sent out, for, for all these kinds of things, all kinds of supplications. There's all kinds of things that need your prayers. You won't run out of prayers. You will be able to pray as long as you can stand up in one place. I guarantee it. There's enough for you in your heart and mind to pray about. But God has a great thing that he is doing in this world. And it's about bringing salvation to all people, as I just heard this morning in Sunday school. And we join him in that physically, spiritually, when we pray. And that's, that's my invitation for you all today. As I take you on a tour of these four um, starred locations that are, are stars and, and hearts in my heart that I can't forget and that I pray for often, I want to invite you today. I hope that your notes from this time together would have prayer requests written of the people in all of those places, that you might join me in praying for them, that you would stand firm together with us as we try to stand firm where God has called us in these locations. 
The first one I'm going to take you to, as you can see there, the red star, it just, it just barely falls on the side of Romania, where Romania used to have a whole lot of Hungarian speakers and a lot of their land used to be hungry. And there's a, a community there that God has uh, really placed in my heart. I've been serving with them for almost 12 years now, 11 and a half. And and God has done a good work. That church building was already there when I got there, but God has grown that community in so many ways. At first, I got there to get connected with the preschool in the basement of that uh, church building. And these are uh, gypsy kids, Roma. Uh, I love each one. And this is uh, the 11th year that we have partnered together with our partner organization in Hungary and the local school to make that preschool a full day preschool where they get a meal and have an afternoon nap. And you see them here getting their um, school bags at the start of the school year. And already, just think about that, 11 years of 40 children a year being raised up in that environment, hearing Bible stories at the preschool and being able to grow healthy and go on to, to school and then to start family. Some of the ones that, that were just in that group when I arrived in town now have children of their own. And that's all because uh, God had a good plan for that community. And he's, he's continued to bless and expand this ministry in Romania that I'm telling you about because you see in this picture uh, the fifth village church that we as North Carolina Baptists have helped to construct so that they could have a meeting place. But, but the incredible testimony that I share with you all today is that those are the five villages. Please do pray for them. You can write down their names. Uh, they're really hard to say, but, but God knows how to say them, right? So if you got them on your paper, you can say, just look right here, God. These, these villages, would you bless them? Because he has been blessing them, but they need more blessings because they're fighting difficult battles with poverty, with, with um, uh, abuse in families and, and problems in the homes. And they're, they're struggling to find jobs. They're struggling to do what God wants, but now we need more leaders in these communities to be raised up. Because you see that picture right there, it's full of light. I want you to just take note of how bright and full of light that church building is, and then take note of how full it is of bodies. And I want to tell you that that very church building was the first we started, and it was more than eight years ago that we started, and that building sat empty, dark, and cold for seven years. And then God moved in and he said, it's time. And now you have a, a congregation that can sing louder than, than a, a thousand people in that little room. And they don't fit in the church building that got built, but that's okay. Because they just open the windows and people stand outside. I, I mean, it just warms my heart because that picture I took on the Sunday when I went in and that church was a different church than I had been there before COVID. And, and I was just overwhelmed, like the warmth and the light just flooded into my body. And I said, I got to take a picture of this. Actually, I didn't take it because my head's there, but I did take another one. But this one was better. And you can see Americans sharing testimony there through a translator. And we've been investing in them for all eight of those years, for all ten of those years that we've been going out there. We even met outside on a slab in, in cold March weather with a bunch of children with no shoes on their feet. And the change that God has brought to that community is that not only do the children have shoes on their feet, but they have Jesus in their heart, and their parents are at church now praising Jesus with them. We hardly had a man set foot in this church building except for the man that had the key that opened the door. And he also came to know the Lord and was baptized before he passed away a year and a half ago. And, and now that church, every woman has a man sitting next to her in the church service. It just brings me great delight, but there's so much more work to do. Here's another church building that, that the local guys built all by themselves in three months during COVID. They didn't have work to do, and they said, well, we could at least build a church building if you'd send us some funds. So we did, and there's that church building. And, and that church building is filled with children from the next village over. That was the church building I showed you at the beginning that's under construction right now. So they will, we bust them in for this children's occasion, but... Uh, there's so much more work to be done in these communities. And I'd like to ask you primarily to pray for the growth of these churches, that it wouldn't stop. There's been so many baptismal services uh, in the last few years, and, and hundreds of people have come to give their lives to Jesus. But not only do they need to be saved, they need to grow up in the Lord, that they can stand firm too, that they can pray and join us in God's mission because it's the right place for them. 
And, and there you see the uh, pastor, Jimmy, in the blue shirt, and he's weary and he's tired and he's struggling physically with his own health. So please pray for the spiritual leaders there. Pray that young ones would be brought up in the Lord, that they could also join in the work of the ministry because it's hard. It's hard to give the Lord's Supper to five different churches every month. It's hard to baptize people when you've got a baptism this Sunday and next Sunday. Oh, and let's do one Saturday too so we can get to all the villages to baptize all the people. That's this month. That's happening there now. But there's also lots of new children, and I had to put this picture of the, uh, the, one of the leader's granddaughters. His daughter has been raised up in the Lord. She wants to be a missionary like Alicia, and she's right there in her church. So pray for them. Pray for the young people, not only to raise their children in the Lord as they have been raised in the Lord in the last 10 years, but that they might become leaders in the church and that they would lead others. And it's a good thing that the Lord has been about. There's a gentleman in that picture holding his backpack strings uh, with the beige on the top. His name is David Ashcraft. He's from North Carolina, and God allowed him to go over there a few times and to invest in these leaders. Well, uh, health has prevented him from being able to get back on the airplane to go over there. But he meets with them every Saturday. And wherever I am in the world, wherever he is in North Carolina and wherever the brothers have been about, they gather at their church and I get on the call and David gets on the call and the brothers get on the call and I translate what he has to share with them and teach them and encourage them. So I just praise the Lord for his investment in the leaders there. And he also has a, a prayer letter if anyone would like to get it monthly of all the things that are going on and uh, through our partner organization, Hungarian Baptist Aid. And he keeps people in North Carolina informed of how they can pray. And, and that's what I'm inviting you to. So if you'd like to get on that list, then come let me know, and I'll give your email address to David Ashcraft. Uh, but, but here we are in January. The Lord bless us with the opportunity to uh, have a retreat for leaders and their families. So you see there are a pastor from North Carolina that came over with another couple that's been serving a long time together with David Ashcraft, and then they came back because they're still able to travel and brought their pastor, uh, Randy Smith, uh, from Pine Tops Baptist. And, and he was able to lead as we had times of worship, as we ate together and had fellowship. We opened God's word and we prayed together for these leaders that they might be encouraged and in 2024 to keep pressing on because the 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 um, poverty and the the oppression from the spiritual forces is is still hard to fight doesn't matter how strong the church is doesn't matter how fast it's growing the enemy is the same the enemy is always the same and so here's some ladies outside of that one church that had a bunch of kids in it in the other picture and then here's one of the poorest communities we work in and the, I would say the most spiritually dark and it's interesting that this picture it kind of brings that feeling of darkness you know what I'm saying like it, I just love pictures and and that community has so much um, um, oppression in their community that's Saint Miklos if you would pray for them that God would would just break the cycle of poverty they often don't have jobs and if they do they're away from their children they're in another country doing migrant work for months at a time and children are just being uh, raising each other and it's a really sad situation the church cares about the poor in their community and the church wants every winter to spend three months every week delivering uh, food bags to those that are in, in deep poverty and and these are the homes they're taking them to I want to show you because they want all of the supporters of North Carolina to know that that they're searching out the poorest in their community to care for and to make sure that they have food each winter uh, praise the Lord Randy and his church were able to support that this year for the whole three months uh, to feed the 30 families that the, the leaders of the church have identified as the poorest. So we've traveled a little bit through my, my special place in Romania, Sekahid, and, and now I'm going to take you to my hometown where I live and where I go to sleep at night on most nights when I live uh, where I live. So that's Najhalas and near Bogdan, and, and our connection there started with this American camp, as that says up there in the sign in, in Hungarian, um, at this school in Najhalas. And, and that was in 2014 in the summer. A, a group from my church came to do a camp there. And when they did that camp the last night, I think I shared this last time with anyone that was here, um, the Almost the entire group of parents and children and families came forward to be saved at the end of that service. And God started a, a church through that. Uh, there you see the backs of the, the retired, now retired principal and his wife who are still faithful uh, uh, 
to come to our church plant efforts and a part of our church plant team as we're trying to plant a church in this community. But we're continuing to minister in the schools, um, both that school and the neighboring school that his son uh, is now the principal of. He's also up in that picture in the, the orange jacket. He's running our technical stuff there. And he runs this school, and so he gives us an open door to go in and have Monday morning Bible studies with all of the, the school teachers, and then we go over to the preschool that's a part of the school and share it with all the preschool workers. That's what this picture is of. And so we continue to do discipleship and evangelism in the actual schools as we're um, seeking the Lord's will for our church plant to grow. And here's Tundi, my ministry partner. She was here with me last time, but she's back holding holding down the front, as I could say, uh, in my absence. And uh, she she has received the gift of a beautiful voice and the ability to lead worship. And so she continues to train up children in the Lord just through singing, and they absolutely love it. And she brings worship songs for them to learn. And at Christmas time, she taught us all uh, songs to to sing as uh, we went from school to school and and we invest in the youth in our community we get to go to big events this is at a stadium uh, where they have a this is the day concert every year where thousands of Hungarian speakers gather to worship and so we're, we're able to connect with with what God is doing and his mission already um, over there and here you see a little boy reciting scripture at a um, at a competition between the different schools Baptist schools that we work in now I, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Baptist schools in just a moment, but but these are not believing children, nor teachers, nor leadership in these schools. They're Baptist in name. But now, because they're coming to understand what it means to be a Baptist school, they're hosting competitions where children and entire psalms have memorized and scriptures, stories from the Gospels, and they could say them from memory. And this is one of the little students we were able to bring from our school. Other opportunities that our schools can connect with, for example, here's a big event in an arena in the heart of Budapest where all the schools brought busloads of people, and William Graham was here there from here uh, to share an evangelistic message but it's also our church plant effort happens in the home with hospitality this is my home and this is a crowd that I had over for Thanksgiving um, not a holiday very celebrated over there but they're growing in it they don't exactly celebrate it like I uh, like we do in North Carolina because they don't have the history of it but they certainly have the heart of it and giving thanks to the Lord uh, and there's been continued ministry through these uh, teams that still come to do summer camps all over Hungary in the Baptist schools that we have an open door in here's my home church this past summer um, it sent a team to work in my school because because even though we've been able to share the gospel through the 10 different summers that we have behind us there's still new children that haven't heard the gospel and there's still people that that are just getting uh to know the truth of the gospel and so we keep on sharing it with them we keep on passing out bibles as you see in the picture on the left there and and my father who's here today he keeps on coming back and building relationships with the the workers at the school with the the people he's gotten to know and it's through relationships that we can share um, about following jesus us. And now I'm going to take you on a trip. Uh, so that was in my hometown, which was the Yellow Star. Now I'm going to take you a, a trip two and a half hours um, down to that Purple Star. And, and there uh, we've been doing the same thing we've done in my community, but just not as regularly. We've always had summer camps at this particular school, but we didn't have a witness of someone in the community other than a few local believers that were really struggling week to week, day to day. And you guys know what that can mean for a community. And, and the Lord called out a couple from North Carolina to just come for a year. And they're over there. They came in September, and this is Tom and April. They're from North Carolina. And she's been teaching in the schools, and he is a, a nurse practitioner and has been helping with all of the medical missions that we do in our spare time, of course, uh, over in Ukraine and Romania, uh, where we have an open door for that. And this is him with a, a family that he helped in Romania. And April um, does what I do during the weekdays and she goes into classrooms to teach English to to share it's really cool the English teacher she's been able to give a Bible to because I knew who they were because we were there every summer but she's gotten close to them she's gotten to share with them what she believes and why she believes it and not only giving them a Bible but then they say well why don't you share a scripture with the kids to open every English class 
So that's how they open English class now, because of April's testimony in that place. And here we are at the Christmas uh, concert that we did in that community. But here is a map of what I'm telling you about. All of these schools are a network of schools that in 2012 decided to be run by the Baptist, an, uh, our par partner organization, Hungarian Baptist Aid. And all of those are places that God is about a great work. And I'd ask you to pray these, these three things. I'm going to give you three things for all of these communities in Hungary where we have this open door because it's a network that I've gotten to know a lot of people in and a lot of principals and a lot of uh, school pastors and other spiritual workers. But the spiritual battle is intense and most of the principles I say are not believers yet so I would ask that you would pray for the principles to come to know the Lord this is the one principle uh, that came to know the Lord through the the ministry in my community that in all of those schools I mean there was a lot 49 of them in all of those schools he's the one that I know for sure is a believer and all the others I have questions about or I'm sure they're not so would you pray for the other 48 principles to come to know the Lord? They've been serving and working with the Baptists for now 10 years, a lot of them. Uh, so we want to see God do that. But he has a plan. I trust him. And we've been able to invest as North Carolinians have come over uh, teaching things about running schools and building up a spiritual life in those schools. We've been able to invest in the spiritual life of all of those schools, giving them some trainings and teachings on that. We have plans to do that again in August. Would you just pray that these schools would would form a spiritual uh, environment for their students. And the last prayer request I have for this community is for the school pastors. Um, all the English-speaking missionaries God may send to work in these schools, every single one could have an, uh, a missionary if, if there was someone to go there. And then also there's a title called Vice Principles of Faith Life that has now been developed where people, like these pictures you see up here, are school pastors and principles of faith life. And they're investing in the students, but their job is hard because their principal isn't necessarily a believer. So would you pray that they would be able to stand and pray even amidst the spiritual attacks. And the last place I want to take you and where we're going to end today is is probably a place that's close to everyone's heart but I just don't want you to forget about it because it's close to my heart too and it's right across the border into Ukraine where people are suffering the 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 darkness and and just the reality of of soldiers and tanks and and guns on every street corner is just intense but there are our, our brothers and sisters fighting the good fight there and i would just want to ask you as paul did on on his behalf but i want to ask you on behalf of all of these people that i love and care about that you would just pray for them that they would proclaim the mystery of the gospel boldly in that place because that's what's needed more than anything else right now so I've just I've just shown you a few faces of our partners over there I know you don't know them all by name and you can't remember all their names but would you just pray for for their weary souls to be renewed by the Spirit of God at this time because because the work is hard it's almost like a 24 hour seven days a week job but they cannot save their country God can so would you pray that they would just join him in a mission and rest, rest in him and know his power? And would you pray that amidst all of the oppression that the enemy has sent to that country, that his church would explode? That's my prayer, and I just want to invite you to pray uh, for that, for those communities. We don't get over there too much now. We were there intensely during the first year of the war, and there still are opportunities to go and to serve those people through uh, medical missions and uh, just through caring. Uh, but would you just pray that God would continue to do a good work in that place? I've, I've shared a bunch of stuff with you. But like I said, if you go home this afternoon, you just stand for 20 minutes in one place and talk to God about him. You won't run out of things to tell him. You won't. Because he's on mission, and it is your delight to actively join him in that mission. So will you stand now and, and join with me as I uh, pray over these different things that I've listed for you all? And maybe, maybe there is something today that you need to talk to God about, that you need to ask him to do for you. Um, and... and these spiritual powers, I didn't go through the list there in Ephesians, but I read it out loud. They're at work, and they're strong. So let's pray and ask God to, to fight on our behalf. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this good day. I thank you for the time and energy and, and availability of all of these people in this room to come to this place to worship you, to, to recognize that you are the God of all and that you are the one that we need in our daily life, God. 
We thank you, God, for the mission that you're about in us and in this world, that you sent your son Jesus to, to die on a cross for us, that, that we might be saved, that we might be renewed, that we might have life and life everlasting. And, Lord, I just want to pray right here for this congregation, asking your blessing on them, that their strength might be renewed in you, that they might stand and stand firm in your mighty power, God, because you reign and you rule, but it is hard in this life, God. So I just pray that you would renew their strength, that you would comfort them in their pain, and, Lord, that you would heal their sicknesses, God. But, Lord, I thank you that I was able today to share in, in, a, in a real fast way, taking them on a tour of the places I love and care about in Hungary and Romania and Ukraine. And, Lord, together with them, as, as they in their places are praying, Lord, and me here out loud, I just pray that you would help and, and, and move forward the work that you're about in those places. Lord, I pray that you would fight the battles that are going on. And I pray that your people, your children, your sons and daughters in those countries would see the victory that you are winning, God, and that their weary spirits would be renewed, God. Lord, I pray for the leaders. I pray that you would uh, raise up new leaders in Romania and Hungary and Ro Ukraine, Lord. I pray that you, there would be more Timothys that the that the Pauls would see, God, and would would uh, take them by the hand and and invite them to to work alongside them. I pray that they would not push them away, Lord. I pray for the same blessing upon this church, God. And Lord, I also want to just pray that you would um, grow the churches, God all of the churches, from my home ch uh, church plant to the churches in Romania to the small churches in Ukraine that are, that are doing everything they can to care for the hurting world around them. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen the churches. I pray, Lord, that you would bring new members, new believers, people hungry for the gospel. But, Lord, I pray that you would also help each church to be focused on Jesus Christ and that you would be the head that leads each and every one. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for the good work that you're about. Thank you that we can stand and join you in that work. Would you give us that, that active commitment to be standing firm in prayer, God? That is so hard in today's world, Lord. We are so busy. Forgive us, God, for our busyness. And forgive us for our laziness. And help us to be able to stand with you. Because you've done it all. And it's our joy to just stand. Thank you, God. We give you praise and we give you glory for all that you are and all that you're doing. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. As we close our service, let's sing, Find Us Faithful.
Bibles that uh, we transliterate rather than translate. And the benediction happens to be one of those. I looked it up. What is a benediction? The dictionary definition is the benediction is to confer a blessing upon the people who hear the speaker. And I just happened to notice that in Numbers chapter 6, God gave the only instructions for giving a blessing to his congregation. He said, these words shall be spoken by the sons of Aaron to all of the congregation of my people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace, and I will bless my people. Go in peace.